That was interesting, wasn't it? You see the music stand go flying? You put three men on the stage, you never know what's going to happen. Good evening, Oakland. What a pleasure it is to be with you. It's been a while since I've been with you. It's been probably at least a good year and a half. But really, it's, it's such a privilege uh, to be able to come down here today uh, and basically spend the day with you. Dennis, Dennis is just a dear, dear friend. Uh, you know that. This, this is a man that has blessed this community, has blessed Northway, and he's blessed me uh, as a friend. So Dennis, I thank you for the invitation, for allowing me to be here with you today. Again, today we wrap our final segment of the Mark series. This is a series that started way back in March. You might be wondering, is it going to ever end? Well, it ends tonight, okay? We're focusing tonight on Jesus and his disciples, the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, and viewing the gospel of Mark through the eyes of the disciples. And personally, I think that this has been a particularly insightful and revealing way of looking at Mark's gospel and looking at the gospel story, because each audience provides a slightly different context, a slightly different filter for understanding what's going on. So now even the most casual reader of Mark, Matthew, Luke, will recognize the similarities. In fact, I challenged, your, challenged the group earlier today that if you would just open your Bible to the Gospels without looking at the top and seeing what Gospel it was, you would probably be hard pressed to know which gospel you're reading in. That's because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so, so related, so tightly related. Uh, we oftentimes refer to them as the synoptic gospels. Uh, in Greek, that literally means being, to be seen together. They are so similar. If you look at the verbiage, if you look at the stories that are told, if you look at the sequence of the stories that are told, they are almost Im impossible to distinguish one from the other. So today we're going to be focusing on, on Mark uh, again. Uh, but, but again, it's, impos it's very important to keep in mind the, the fact that these Gospels are in some ways interchangeable and they definitely inform the understanding one to another. Let me give you an illustration. If you look at the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, there's a particular story of John the Baptist. And this story of John the Baptist, when you compare Matthew and Luke, has 61 words out of 63 that are identical. It's kind of suggestive. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the verbatim agreement is at 50%. That tells you that without a doubt, these Gospels are not just totally independent compositions, but that Mark paved the way. Mark was the foundation for the Gospels, and that Matthew and Luke most likely used uh, Mark's gospel when they wrote. So today we're going to begin again zeroing in on Mark. Uh, I really invite you today, today to help us look at Jesus' final command and exhortation to his disciples in the form of the Great Commission. So before we dig any further, before we go on anymore, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being in Oakland today, being able to talk with this group, being able to wrestle with scripture together. Lord, Scripture is so rich. Scripture is so powerful. Scripture is so life-giving. And the opportunity that we have, Lord, to engage it and to come away with something is profound. There's no other book in the world, Lord, that impacts the way the Bible does. So, Lord, I ask you to impact us all this morning. Touch us all this morning, this afternoon. I've lost. Help us to understand and realize what you have for us, what you have individually for every person in this room. And Lord, bless us with that. In your son's name, amen. Obviously, I'm fried. <laughs> Three services, I'm an old man. I'm not as young as these guys. It's almost not fair. All right, join me as we take a few minutes to look at Mark's gospel, particularly chapter 16. Uh, we're going to look at verses uh, 14 through 20. These are the last words in Mark's gospel. Right after the resurrection, we read this chunk of text. He says, Afterward, he, Jesus, appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, 
go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up deadly serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Now, in an effort to lay to rest an issue that is sometimes a source of confusion, oftentimes a source of confusion, it should be noted, whenever you look at your Bible, you might see some little print in the very back of the Gospel of Mark. That's because the verses that we just read are not contained in the best and the oldest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Now, that being the case, bear, bear in mind, there's 5,800 uh, manuscripts of the New Testament. None of the oldest manuscripts have this section of the Gospel of Mark. But I believe that the content and the coverage of what Mark has to say here so parallels what Matthew says in Matthew 28 and what Luke says in Acts chapter 1 that we can't bypass it. We can't look past it. We've got to look at it and focus in and see what he has to say. I'm going to go to Acts for a moment. This is a verse most of you all know, most of you have probably grown up with. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'll be bouncing around between Matthew, Acts, and Mark today. Okay? So stay with me. As I stand here and look over you today, look out at this group, I recognize that probably most of you sitting here enjoy a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. Maybe you came to Christ in an early part of your life. Maybe you've always been a believer, as, as long as you can remember. Maybe you received Christ at some point in this church or in another church. Praise God for that realization. Now, well, well woven through my message today is a particular expression that I'd like to have you toss around in your minds and think about as we go through the duration of this sermon. I want you to ponder this. This is my sermon title, in fact. It's called, After You Raised Your Hand. Now, what does this refer to? Many of us came to Christ and prayed the so-called sinner's prayer. Father, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ as coverage for my sins. Yada, yada. Right? Many of us received Christ that way. Some of us raised our hands in a worship service. Some of us came forward in a worship service. But what did you do after you raised your hand. What did you do after you came forward? Well, what did you do after you prayed the sinner's prayer? I'm in the midst of reading a book that I think is one of the most phenomenal resources I've ever seen on discipleship. It's by David Platt called Follow Me. Unfortunately, no relation, okay? Some of you may be familiar with one of his prior books or more than one of his prior books. Radical, Radical Together, counterculture. But in this book, Follow Me, Platt takes a decidedly strong view, critical of Christians who have simply prayed the sinner's prayer or raised their hands. That there is something decidedly wrong in his view with the eye-centered descriptions of how we come to faith. Now, I can understand in some measure what he's saying here, because it's really not by our initiative, is it? The Holy Spirit has already worked in our hearts. The Holy Spirit has already helped us to gravitate toward the Lord so that we can receive him. So he, he makes a point here, but I'm not somebody that's going to be emphatic about this point. I tend to think that the sinner's prayer has value. 
I tend to think raising your hand in worship has value. I tend to think coming forward has value. The bottom line here is that's not where it ends. That's not where it stops. That that is the beginning and not the end. And that's what's behind my whole point today. After you raise your hand. Okay? I want you to consider what I think is a fascinating little piece of scripture. Luke chapter 6, verse 14. And when the day came, he called his disciples. Okay, clearly Jesus calling his disciples here. And chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Again, the context of the verse is Jesus calling his disciples. And what's interesting to me is the text gives us two steps. It says he called his disciples, and then it says he singled out 12 of them, and they would be the apostles. The point being, Jesus clearly called more than 12 men to him that day. You see, the point that I want you to catch is that just as Jesus chose those 12 on that particular day, you, my friends, are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today I want to explore as well a little bit of what that really means, okay? So here we have two terms that we need to define. Disciple on one hand and apostle on the other. Now during the first century, the Greco-Roman world had its share of religious, philosophical, and political leaders. All who had their followings, followers who were committed to their cause, to their teaching, to their beliefs. There were several terms that were used to refer to these followers, but none as popular or as common as the Greek word mathetes, which means to follow, a follower, an apprentice, an understudy, an intern. Do you get the idea? That's what a disciple is, a follower an apprentice, an understudy, an intern, okay? This is the term that came also to be used to refer to Jesus' 12 disciples. It's very important here to recognize that in the context of the Great Commission, what does Matthew tells us, tell us? Matthew tells us to make disciples of all nations. It didn't end with the 12. It started there. So what, are the, what do we mean by apostle then? The original Greek word apostolos is, is literally comes from an expression that means to be sent out. Okay, that's history. That's in the background here. The word in Latin, when it's translated uh, from the Greek, is missus, which is the word where we get missionary. Gives you a slightly different picture. A disciple is one who receives. A di disciple is one who follows. A disciple is one who ardently holds on to the teachings that he's being given. An apostle, I'd like to suggest in this context, is one who's propelled outward, who's sent out to further the Great Commission, to take God's word out into the world. You might have reached, uh, immediately flash back to Matthew 26, 18, when Jesus commands his disciples to go forth and make disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, by his own authority as the living God, dispatches his followers to communicate the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's an apostle. An apostle is one that goes out under the authority of his mentor, under the authority of his leader. And Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth? Okay, Jerusalem is home turf. Jerusalem is where we are most comfortable. Judea, we're still somewhat comfortable. We're still in our general territory, but we're starting to get out there a little bit further. Samaria, we might share some things in common, but they don't trust us and we don't trust them. They don't like us and we don't like them. And the ends of the earth, well, for heaven's sakes, those are the people who hate your guts. Those are the people that want nothing to do with you. Those are the people that, at the face of it all, do not want anything to do with the message that you've got. Comfort zones are well behind, and we are in uncharted waters. What I really want you to see here, though, 
and Luke 6, is that the Great Commission has two facets that we can call the discipling facet and the, quote, apostle facet. He called the 12 first as disciples. First as disciples, as followers, as apprentices, as understudies. And then he dispatched them to carry Christ's redemptive message from there. Translated, it's my opinion that we have the responsibility to be fully discipled in the ways of God, in the things of God, so that we can thoughtfully carry the message from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Consider Paul. You ever think about this? This is something that I landed on this week as I was studying. Most people would say that Paul's conversion, when he was on the Damascus Road, took place somewhere around 32 AD. But if you know anything about the chronology of the New Testament, you'll realize that it was in the 40s, 46, 47, where before Paul began his first missionary journey. That suggests that Paul may have been studying for a good 14 years before he went out, before he started carrying the gospel to the, to the Gentile nations. Now, I'm not recommending that. Okay, 14 years. I tried that. I went to grad school, seminary, and all that stuff. I had pretty close to 14 years, at least in that. Uh, that's probably not the way to do it. But the point, I think, is clear. We've got to understand that about which we speak. We've got to be knowledgeable. We've got to be able to bring the Word of God. And while we're on this, I think it's critical that we recognize that discipling is not my responsibility toward you. It's not Scott's responsibility towards you. It's not Dennis's responsibility towards you. It's your responsibility. You have to decide that you want to be nourished, that you want to be nurtured, you want to be fed. The onus is squarely on you to ensure that you are getting the requisite building up that you require. Again, 14 years, okay, that might be overkill, but we need to be prepared. Trust me, again, I tried it. It doesn't work. Do you want to learn how to drive a car from a teenager? Not that there's not some good teenage drivers out there, but wouldn't you rather learn to drive a car from somebody who's been driving for a lot of years? As long as it's not grandma, right? Return to Mark's presentation to the Great, Great Commission. We recall that Jesus and the disciples were reclined at table when this took place. And what were they talking about? Were they talking about the weather? Were they talking about the pirates' latest streak? Heck no. Jesus was chastising them. Jesus was criticizing them because of their lack of faith and their hardness of heart. Duh! Think about this for a minute. These men had been with Jesus for three years. These men had experienced the miracles of Jesus, the wonder of Jesus. And yet at this point, moments before Jesus would be taken into heaven, they are still fraught with unbelief and hardness of heart. You know, when you look at that picture, when you think of that picture, at least when I think of that picture, I want to reach into the screen and knock their heads together and say, what are you thinking? Are you thinking? I've long puzzled over the plight of the disciples, how they could go on and just be so oblivious to what was around them. Fast forward 2,000 years. Fast forward to today. Same question. What's it going to take? As believers, each and every one of us should be advancing the kingdom in the manner to which God has called each of us. Maybe we have been discipled, perhaps repeatedly. Maybe we are just new to the faith. Perhaps we need to be in a discipling relationship or working toward advancing our faith to the point that we can really run with God's calling on our lives. Maybe you were there and simply have not gotten around to it. 
Folks, that's never a legitimate excuse. The individual with a Christ-centered life should always be in the position to do something for Christ and his kingdom. Again, it's not a job for me. It's not a job for Dennis. It's not a job for Dan. It's not a job for Scott. This is a job that we are all equally called to. Now, I want you to listen very closely here because I am not saying that we have to jump through a series of hoops before we can be used by God. I'm not saying that we have to clear a number of hurdles before we can bring God's gospel to the world. What I am saying here is that in order to be fully up to date, to full, be fully engaged, we do have to be discipled. But on the other hand, we all have experience to draw upon. If God did something so profound in your life at one point in time that you received him, you've got a story to tell. You have got something that you can share. You have got something persuasive that might bring somebody to Christ. Did something honestly happen between the time that you received Christ, after the time you raised your hand, and now? Or are you stuck? Has there been no movement? This begs yet another question. What is the role of works in my Christian life? After all, if you haven't tuned me out yet by now, you probably heard me say, do, do, do. Do this, do that, do this. Am I saying that if I don't do things, delve into the word, communicate the gospel, I'm not a believer? Is plat lapsing into a works mentality? The easy answer here is for me to say, no, you're still in Christ. However, I'm not going to make it that simple for you. If you aren't doing these things, then one can legitimately ask the question whether you really are a Christian. That may sound a little bit harsh, but go to the words in the epistle to, of James. James chapter 2, verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Can that faith save him? Works or fruit, whatever you want to call it, are not a means to an end. They are not the means by which we gain salvation. They are the authentication of the fact that something has happened in us. And we are going to share that beyond our generation, beyond our world. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. The Great Commission is sometimes referred to as the Great Omission. Because many of us don't do it. Many of us don't follow it. Mark 16, 15 puts it this way. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This is a command. This is an imperative in Greek. Now, all of us know that any imperative we encounter in life, we can decide whether we're going to listen or we can punt. We can decide not to. Okay? Take the kid that you tell not to put their hand in that cookie jar. What's the kid going to do? Gonna do? Parents, you know, doggone well what the kid's going to do. That kid's going to be in there faster than you can then you can turn around. When we decide to punt on a command and do not do what we are told, there are consequences. If you don't drive 55 on I-79, you may find yourself making a donation to Policeman's Ball. Failure to adhere to Christ's great commission bears with it eternal consequences. Conceivably to the individual you neglected to bring the gospel to, but also for yourself. There's a scripture out there, and I hesitated to share it today because it, it kind of makes you churn up inside. It's a difficult scripture, and I think it's the scariest scripture in the entire Bible. This is Matthew 7, 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Is this verse even relevant here? I'm not going to state my reputation on it, but it's one I don't want to tangle with. And if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side of following Christ and adhere to his commands. So what have you done after you raised your hand? I'm going to get personal with you for a minute here. I received Christ Jesus when I was in the ninth grade. And if I'm calculating correctly, and my math is lousy, that would have been March of 1971. That's before many of you were even a glimmer in mom and dad's eyes. I started off strong, read scripture, prayed, went to a Christian college, pursued my idea, my calling, what I felt, to be a pastor and went to seminary. From here, I went on and pursued another master's and a doctorate, focusing on the languages and the lands relative to the Bible. Sounds idyllic, doesn't it? Clear faith on a clear path? Wrong. Since the ninth grade, my Christian life was one like, one like I was riding on the thunderbolt on a regular basis. Had, I had a student this past year question me in the classroom. He raised his hand, and I could tell he was looking to bait me. He says, well, obviously, you have been a Christian all your life. You have believed this all your life. And I said, stop. Time out for a minute here. I'm going to confess to you that I have never lost my faith. But there have been times in my life that my faith has been on the extreme periphery. That I really didn't acknowledge it, that I really didn't embrace it, and by golly, I really didn't live into it. Feel that way? Ever feel that way? I became, truth be told, more concerned about what people thought of me than what my God thought of me. And that's a scary position to be in. And unfortunately, it's an easy rut to find yourself in. God hadn't given up on me yet, however, but I had to start living better, a life that was honoring to him. Today, when I am in that same position where I feel like this is not a great position, I don't want to be here, I don't want to share the gospel, I usually turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. The account of David it says, and it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David, David went, brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone up six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod and so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, and incidentally the wife of King David, saw him leaping and dancing before the Lord. And what was her response? She despised him in her heart. Folks, that is sometimes the response to bringing the gospel. People ain't going to like it. But what should our response be? What should our attitude be? Look at David again. David didn't give a rip about what Michal thought. He didn't care what anyone else thought. He was going to worship his God. He was going to praise his God, whatever that meant. Oh, that I could get to the point that David did. Well, over the past 20 years, God has been doing some amazing things in my life. It essentially started with an incredible encounter of the Holy Spirit about 20 years ago. But the event I want to highlight today, as I draw this message to a close, occurred in the summer of 2008. June 30th, July 1st, 2008. I had a massive heart attack. That has a way of making you stop and assess and think what's important. What's important? Where have I put my chips in this game of life? And where should I be wagering? 
When I tell you today that it's a pleasure to be standing in front of you, I mean it. It's a pleasure to be standing, period. Okay, God did something amazing when he brought me through that. And I can't resist now. When I'm, when I'm in a teaching situation, when I'm in a preaching situation, I tend to get excited. I tend to enjoy it. But let me tell you something about me. I'm a very shy person. Can't you tell? But I have long reveled in being in front of a classroom or on the Northway platform. I've always said that I am convinced that God gifted me the way that he did so that I can't naturally take credit for anything good that I might possibly do. Folks, if I had my druthers, I'd be back in that corner behind that partition, twiddling my thumbs and listening instead of standing up here and talking. That's just not who I am. That's just not my nature. But that's what God decided to do with me. With that life altering experience, something profound happened. There was a new and enhanced energy and passion every time I stepped up to teach. And with every day and with every breath that I take, I yearn to serve him. I crave the opportunities he gives me to teach and otherwise share his word. You see, my answer to the question, what did you do after you raised your hand, was not a particularly good answer. In fact, up to that point, it stunk. I was a nominal Christian, and I had to come to grips with that. I had to realize that fact and acknowledge it. A believer, a name, and an association only, but otherwise an individual essentially undifferentiated from the others. One of my favorite authors is a man that so hopefully some of you have heard of, John R.W. Stott. Stott said that one of the worst things a Christian can ever hear is the words, but you are no different from them. Folks, I was content to live a life. I lived too long satisfied with that criticism, satisfied with where I was. That's what I wanted, but never again, never again. For his kingdom and for his glory, I endeavor with the help of the Holy Spirit to live a God-honoring life now. Never again will there be an incongruity between who I am and who I profess to be. I want to have a good answer to what I did after I raised my hand. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And let it be so. Amen. As we close tonight, I always like to give an opportunity in case there's somebody sitting in this group that has not experienced the love of Christ. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. You have the chance to step out and begin to live a life that is glorifying to him. I'm going to lead you in a moment in a prayer. And if that is you, let me encourage you to pray these words or pray some other words that basically sync up, that basically make the statement. Okay? I'm going to ask you to all bow your heads. Not look around. This is the time where it's tempting to peek. But don't do it. And let's just offer this prayer, this simple prayer to God. Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know that just as Paul says in Romans, I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, I can be redeemed today. It can change today, in this moment, in this time, by acknowledging where I stand with respect to you. Lord, I deserve hell. But by your grace and by your mercy, 
I can understand that I receive eternal life. Now with every head bowed, if there's anyone here in this room today that prayed this prayer, that uttered these words, let me encourage you to raise your hand so that I might see you, so that I may see you and that I might acknowledge this with you. Anyone here today that this might be the first time for you? Okay. I'm not done with you yet. Because I believe that there may be some of you that are sitting here today that were in the same kind of rut that I am. That I found myself. That I realized I am not lived into what you have called me to, Lord, since I first raised my hand. But today, today in this place, at this time, I covenant with you. I covenant with you that I am going to step forth and with the power and the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be able to answer yes. Yes, I have made a difference. I have carried your word beyond this place and I have lived a life that is glorifying to God. If there's anybody here today that feels you need to make that recommitment, let me ask you to raise your hand for me a moment. Okay, great. I see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, it's amazing to ponder the enormity of what you did for us in not sparing your son, Jesus Christ. In having him go to the cross willingly to bear the sins that we continue and continue to commit. Father, today we affirm you. We bless you. We love you. And we thank you that you loved us enough. Now, Lord, make us a people that in return will love you and embrace you enough to carry your word, to carry your message, to carry this great commission on to the next generation. Lord, help us all, wherever we are placed, to make disciples of all the nations, whether we're in our comfort zone or out where they hate our guts. Lord, we bless you and we praise you today. In your son's name, amen. As we